We're going to look at uh, today why incense. And uh, the verse that we are uh, really looking at here in Hebrews, you won't have to look, you can open up your Bible there, in Hebrews chapter 13, but uh, it's just these two verses. Why incense? Prayer for us. Uh, sorry, pray for us, for we are confident that we have a good conscience in all things, desiring to live honorably, but I especially urge you to do this, that I may be restored to you the sooner. That's the, uh, the words there in, in the, the book of Hebrews. And to me, you know, it sounds awful like the words of the great apostle Paul, the way he would speak, and, uh, and uh, particularly when we're thinking about the background of all this and why he said that to be restored to you the sooner. Anyway, let's pray. Our gracious God, we pray that you will guide us now as we come to look at your word together. We pray, Lord, your blessing, and we pray, Lord, your leading. We ask, O oh Lord, that you will lead and guide by your Holy Spirit. We pray, Lord, your blessing. And we ask, O oh Lord, now that you will help us by your Holy Spirit to understand something, maybe something that's boggling, uh, complicated, difficult, and yet, Lord, you know, you can guide us, and we pray, Lord, your help by your Holy Spirit, we ask it in Jesus' name, and for his sake and glory, amen. Mm -hmm. So we welcome you to the service, and to, uh, if you're looking online, then uh, quite happy there to, to come there. So, what's the meaning of incense? Why incense? What's the meaning of incense? See, the Jews offered incense morning and evening on the altar of incense. That was the, like what it would be in the uh, tabernacle, in the holy place. Uh, at the back of that was the Holy of Holies, where the Ark of the Covenant was. But in the first place, there was this uh, a altar of incense, where they offered up incense. And they would offer up prayers, of course, with that too as well. But the smoke would go up, and it would be quite interesting and quite amazing. They would take the um, uh, coals from off the, the altar where the fire was going all the time, uh, and they would, uh, they would uh, take a, the coals from that, bring it to the altar of incense, and then they would burn incense on the altar. And so they offered incense morning and evening. And the Lord said to Moses, Take some spices, uh, uh, Stacia and Uncha and uh, Gabbalum and pure frankincense. But these things, nobody else, we don't know much about them and uh, we know about frankincense of course, but they're special. There were special things that uh, only mentioned there in the Old Testament. Uh, pure frankincense with these sweet spices, there shall be equal amounts of each you shall make of these an, in, an incense, a compound according to the art of the perfumer, salted, pure, uh, and holy. It was for a holy use. No one was to use this uh, personally for themselves. They couldn't be uh, making themselves nice and smelly and, and wonderfully, you know, with it. Uh, because it was particularly this offering of incense up to God in heaven. And you shall beat some of it very fine, and put some of it before the testimony in the tabernacle of meeting, where I shall will meet with you. It shall be most holy to you, but as for the incense which you shall make, you shall not make any for yourselves. According to its composition, it shall be to you holy. Interesting, isn't it, for the Lord? Whoever makes any, any like it, to smell it, to make themselves nice and, you know, he shall be cut off from the people. Wouldn't be allowed to do that for personal use. So what we're thinking today is, well, what's the meaning of incense? Why was it there? And what was it teaching the children of Israel, uh, the Jews? Well, it's figurative language, isn't it? It's 39 times offerings and incense translated a sweet aroma in the New King James Version that we use. 
and uh, the other one then, 40 times, offerings and incense translated in the, the, the KJV, the King James Version, the uh, authorised version. And it's there translated a sweet savour. Right? Sweet savour. So, uh, and there's only one place then uh, that uh, they differ somewhat. And that is, and the Lord smelled a soothing aroma in the King James Version. A sweet savour in the New King James. Then the, sorry, a soothing aroma in the, in the New King James Version. And uh, in the KJV it's a sweet aroma, a sweet savour. Pointing to the flavour and to the, uh, you know, the perfume. Then the Lord said in his heart, I will never again curse the ground for man's sake. Although the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth, nor will I again destroy every living thing that I have done. And so there it was. But that is um, the only difference. And this is the one time the New King James translates it that a soothing aroma. Uh, So, what's the meaning of incense? Why is it there? So, first of all, what does it picture? Well, it was really filling the holy place with a sweet aroma and a smoke ascending up, you know, there to God in heaven, of course. Only to the Lord for worship and prayers offered. There'd be prayers offered with that. Remember there was one man came in to burn incense. Only once in his life he could be chosen to do that, Zechariah. Hey? And he had that one chance. And at that one chance he uh, didn't believe God saying to them that they were going to have a baby. Uh, uh, and he was speechless. He was dumb then until the baby was born. And so he wasn't able to pray for the people at that particular and to offer the ironic benediction. Then another angel having a golden censer came and stood at the altar. It was he was given much incense that he should offer it with the prayers of all the saints upon the golden altar which was before the throne. We're talking about in heaven now. And the smoke of the incense with the prayers of the saints ascended before God from the angel's hand. You might wonder, who are these saints? These saints are not made by men, they're made by God. When we repent and put our faith and trust in Christ, we are separated to God, we are saints. You see, we might always act like saints. But really, in a sense, that's how God looks down on us when he sees us trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ as our Saviour and friend and Lord. Our lives changing and getting more and more like Jesus. Do our prayers ascend like incense? And so, he's praying, pray for us, the writer here. Says, pray for us, for we are confident that we have a good conscience in all things desiring to live honourably. But I especially urge you to do this, that it may be restored to you the sooner. So that's the challenging verse that comes before us about prayer. And uh, it's very important. So we're going to look at that in three ways. The plea, the pressure. And the parable. The plea. Well, it sounds like a plea from Paul, from the great apostle Paul. Very much like that. But we know that the Bible has been written. Man has used the Bible to write. It doesn't say in the book of Hebrews that it was Paul wrote it. So many of his letters do say that. And uh, But at this particular end of it, to, that, to the book of Hebrews, it seems very much like his way of writing. But then, of course, the Holy Spirit can use that, and uh, we're not here, I'm not here to 
dictate I'm not here to say absolutely categorically but it does seem a bit like his plea. More men than Paul there because he says us. Pray for us. So it's very, prayer is very important. Nothing can happen without prayer and prayer is the most important thing that God has planned and yet it is the one area that the devil hits and he doesn't want us to pray. Leaders are often attacked. I know what that is. We're attacked. And, and we're attacked in our prayer life. And we're attacked in bringing things to God in prayer. And it's very important, you know, to, to learn how to grow and how God can help us in all this. As it says in other places, the enemy goes around like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. And of course the Jews here would attack Paul. They were attacking Paul and did at times. And it would seem to be there is an attack upon the writer here in what he's saying. But I want you to know, brethren, that the things which happened to me have actually turned out for the furtherance of the gospel so that it has become evident to the whole palace guard and to all the rest that my chains are in Christ. So some people were saying, Ah, oh, Paul, you shouldn't be in prison. And particularly this verse is really thinking that most likely it's at the time of Paul's first uh, a, you know, imprisonment in Rome, when he was in house arrest. And so he says, but you know, he was taken into prison, but it's for the furtherance of the gospel. So that it has become evident that the, what? The whole palace guard. Who's the palace guard? The palace guard, of course, is the soldiers. Remember when the Apostle Paul was there sitting? There was a, 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 there was a soldier here and a soldier here. And he would, uh, and of course, as he moved, the chains would rattle. Even though he was under house arrest, you know, in his rented house. But you see, Paul had the chance there of talking to these men, talking about why he is there and, and what the Jews said and done to him and, and the different things that happened. But most of all, he'd be telling them how Jesus died on the cross to save people and that he has come all the way uh, and he believes God has him there, you know, to testify to the saving faith of the Lord Jesus Christ. There, as he'd stand before Caesar, you know, and eventually, of course, was released. So that was the, the plea, the plea that he brought to them. For us, for us, others that were with him too, and some of them would be with him in prison, of course. The pressure. Confident of a clear conscience. Great pressure upon him. At times, he was very much challenged. Ah, oh, Paul, your conscience can't be clear, you know. Why would, a, why would someone be in prison if they didn't do something wrong, if they weren't a sinner? And of course, he telling them he's confident of a clear conscience before God. You know, he's not, per, not perfection he's trusting in, not sinless perfection, not a perfect life, as, as you would read there in Romans 8. Uh, in Romans shall we, chapter 7, when he talks about the old nature and the old man and the battle between these two natures. It's not perfection, a perfect life, a sinless life, but it's trusting in the, what? The finished work of Christ. God's righteousness at Christ's expense, we, we, we thought about another day. The grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. And so he's trusting in the finished work. That Christ died on the cross for his sins. That's what he's trusting in. Not in good efforts. Not on trying to live a good life. Not on good works. However good they might be. But he's trusting in Jesus alone. You know. How can a jailbird live honorably? Well, he's living utterly there. How does they happen out in Uzbekistan and, uh, and different parts of the world? Uh, 
I've heard of some of them getting freed. I think the one in Uzbekistan maybe has got, got freed. I'm not sure. How can they live on it? Well, they were there. As they're sometimes beaten and, and tried and, and they go through terrible things. And they can take it honourably. They can take it on the chin as it were. They can take it because they're taking it for Jesus. they been suffering with Jesus, aren't they? Not suffering for their sins, but suffering for the cause of Christ. That suffering in jail will not save a person. It will not, have, not get them to heaven any easier or quicker. But of course it's suffering for the cause of Christ. His testimony under house arrest. And so many of those soldiers and palace guard had come to personal faith in Christ because of the Apostle Paul's testimony. And the person who is there at that time, whoever it might be, but we're, we're thinking about Paul and what he done, if this is the all. One day we'll know. We'll say, oh, I'd like to know who wrote the book of Hebrews. Was it the Apostle Paul or was it somebody else? Well, of course we know it was the Holy Spirit who guided men of all. For indeed, when we come to Macedonia, our bodies had no rest. Again, it's very much like the Apostle Paul's, that's, that of course was his writing there. For indeed, when we come to Macedonia, that's in Greece of course, uh, north of Greece, uh, maybe it was a bit more south at that time. Our bodies had no rest. But we were troubled on every side. The battle ahead. Outside were conflicts, inside were fears. So it wasn't easy for him. Not easy in the Christian life. It's not a piece of cake. And it wasn't easy for the Apostle Paul. So uh, nevertheless, God who comforts the downcast, comforted us by the coming of Tancus. Sometimes a person comes and they can be a great encouragement to you, can't they? We encourage one another. And, and uh, you know, uh, we, we looked at that already, where it can be angels in, uh, uh, you know, can come. Uh, entertaining angels unawares. But nevertheless, God, who comforts the downcast, comforts us by the coming of Titus. He knew about Titus. Titus was one of the workers. The, the, the man that was eventually well, sent to, to uh, Crete, wasn't he? Mm -hmm. Coming of Titus. And not only by his coming, but also by the consolation with which he was comforted in you. When he told us of your earnest desire, your mourning, your zeal for me, so that I rejoiced even more. And so there was that comfort and consolation and rejoicing. Yes, in there. Right. So, we're getting on. We looked at the plea, and then the pressure that was upon the great Apostle Paul, or the, the writer of this book at that time, um, some of it was definitely because he, he was writing to the Corinth, the church at Corinth. And then we looked at the pardon there. We're thinking of the pardon now. The pardon. But I especially urge you. To do this, that I may be restored to you the sooner. Why does he say that? To be restored. Why does he say to be restored to you the sooner? Is that because the writer is ill? He's sick? Restored to help? Well, could be that, you know. Who knows? Again, we'll have to wait and see. We'll find out one day, won't we? Many things we we'll learn, you know. Uh, maybe, but then someone else has said, you know, all the answers will fade and the Lord could work out anyway. Because what? You see, it'll not matter because we'll see Jesus and he's the answer of the hope and the blessing. Right. Restored to freedom. Perhaps this person has been stored, restored to freedom, you know, isn't it? Out of jail, restored to freedom, to be a free man. And not to be in those chains. When you think about in a prison, in a Roman prison, it was tough. 
It wasn't easy. You know, it's a, it's a big prayer request. And it's a big prayer request for many people in prison today. And many people suffering beheading for the cause of Christ. Throughout the world. It's the, the greatest time in, 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 it's the greatest century for persecution. There's an awful lot happening throughout the world, right across the, the country. You see, uh, we have a, a map there showing the, the, the belt across where there's persecution. That red, those red uh, parts of the map is, is all areas where there's persecution. And so, do our prayers ascend like incense? Yes, if we're coming in the name of Jesus, because Jesus said to pray in his name, and to remember that he's at the right hand of the Father praying for us, and, and he can bring our prayers perfectly before the throne room of heaven, before the Father in heaven. He has the five bleeding wounds, you see, and he's suffered for our sins and paid the price of our sins and fallen on the cross of Calvary. And so he's there. The great thing, isn't it? He's died on the cross and he rose again, that was, his death was a sacrifice, was accepted by God the Father, risen up from the dead, empty grave, empty tomb, and then ascended to the right hand. And of course, two messengers came and told that those that were gobsmacked looking up into heaven said, oh, why are you standing here? This Jesus who you saw go up into heaven was so come in the same way as you've seen him go up. On with the business then they had to do, you know. Tell the world. And that's what's been happening ever since. So our prayers ascend to God through Christ. Isn't that right? They ascend to God the Father through Christ. They come through him. That's the instruction. We can't come directly to God. We have to come through Jesus because he's the only mediator between God and man. And God will hear us then, you see. We cannot go directly. We cannot assume that on our own authority. We haven't got that authority as Jesus taught the apostles. And they saw how necessary it was. And of course the great apostles' prayer there that we read in, in uh, Ephesians 2, chapter 3, 14 as well. So we want to thank you for listening. Thank you for viewing. Uh, you're a very quiet uh, group of people. And... Uh, we pray that God will indeed bless you. And if you want to know further, you can visit the website at any time. There's no charge for that, of course. We do everything's free here anyway. Isn't that great? So, let's, let's pray. Our gracious God, we thank you for your blessings. We pray, Lord, your hand upon us. We ask, O oh Lord, you lead and guide by your Holy Spirit, and we pray your blessing. We thank you that we can come in Jesus' name. We thank you that you have provided this way, that you are the way, the truth, and the life. We thank you that we have this great access into your presence. And we thank you that you are the only mediator between God and man. And we pray now that as we bring our prayers and requests, and we have many personal things upon our hearts and minds, that we can in the silence bring to you, Lord. We pray that you'll hear. And you will have. And O oh Lord, we ask your blessing. We thank you that you care for us, you love us. We pray, Lord, your hand upon each one. Now as we conclude with the grace, and uh, we should uh, conclude with it there in uh, Hebrews, because there's the great... Uh, Ending there in Hebrews chapter 13. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 20. Let's hear the benediction here. Now may the God of peace, who brought up from our Lord Jesus from the dead, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you complete in every good work to do as well, working in you, that, in you that which is well-pleasing in his sight, 
through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen.